Before I start, let me tell you that I am a mathematical engineer uh, who works as a management scientist, and this means that I am doing data processing all the time. It is part of my job description. I also love technology. I particularly love smart technology. I love AI. I love artificial intelligence. Well, I make artificial intelligence. I also have a keen interest in knowledge. And through this, to understand how the top uh, experts of uh, humanity think, I conducted a series of interviews with uh, 20 top scientists, including 17 Nobel laureates. Now, based on these, I want to argue that we need to put artificial intelligence in its rightful place, and then it will make our life easier. And if we don't do that, we will end up paraphrasing Theodore Rosak, AI being another one of those brilliant solutions that are still in search for the right problem. So in this talk, I will a little bit oversimplify the notion, uh, notions about technology, and I will greatly oversimplify what I tell you about human thinking and learning. However, you will get the general idea about how the two compare. So, in my, in my grandfather's time, if someone got drunk, they called a horse-drawn carriage to take them home. Today, if someone gets drunk, they call a taxi to take them home. The car is not an artificial horse. It can perform the same task. It might be able to outperform the horse in many ways. However, in some other ways, it will not even resemble the horse. For instance, the taxi can take me from the Strathclyde University here to the lighthouse. It might be able to do it faster. It might not get tired in the process. However, if you happen to enjoy horseback riding, it cannot give you that. You cannot play polo with it. And if you happen to be uh, uh, interested in learning how to care about another living being, you will not learn that with a car. So what I would like to do is to use this comparison between the car and the horse as a metaphor for comparing machines and humans. So specifically, I want to compare big data analytics with thinking and artificial intelligence, specifically the algorithms of artificial neural networks to the human learning. Are they the same? Are they similar? Is one better than the other one? Let's see. Let me start with the big data analytics. Data analysis is about things that we store in a database. What we do then, we compare, contrast the features of these data, and we can group the data items based on these features. For instance, if we had a database about the audience uh, here today, we could, for instance, compare who prefers chocolate to uh, pickles, or who had uh, ice water today, and who had hot tea. If we also had your pictures in those databases, then we would be able to compare the pictures based on pixel numbers and based on, uh, based on the color codes. We can also discover patterns of these data features, which can, for instance, facilitate face recognition. However, using the metaphor from Dan Ariely, big data is like teenage sex. Everyone talks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it. Everyone thinks that everyone else is doing it, and therefore everyone says that they are doing it. In reality, not so much. Apart from a few data-centered companies like Google, there are very, very few who make really, really good use of big data. There are some excellent examples of using big data from sports. For example, if you think about a football game, soccer, so you record with 37 cameras the whole football field. However, in the room, there are not 37 screens. There are 22 screens, one for each of the players. It is processed real time. Then the player's behavior in the field is analyzed for patterns, and the findings are fed back to the coach. However, there is a very important point here. Then it is the coach who decides what to do about this. And that leads us to the realm of thinking. And thinking has many different features uh, compared to data processing. Let me highlight just four of these. 
intuition, analogical thinking, seeing the essence, and the perception of harmony and beauty. <coughs> intuition is a very important feature of our thinking, which is definitely not data processing. We make intuitive leaps. That means seeing patterns that no one has seen before and creating new patterns that did not exist before. For example, when Michelangelo was in the mountains of Carrara looking for that perfect uh, piece of marble, he told his helpers that the process takes so long because he needs to find the piece of marble in which the statue already lives, because in that case, all he needs to do is to remove the superfluous parts. Analogical thinking is about having a mental model which is analogous to something in reality. We can make operations with these models. The absolute uh, most famous example is probably Nikola Tesla. The only time when Nikola Tesla made blueprints is when he was filing patents. He did not need blueprints for his work. He created his machines in his mind, he modified them in his mind, he fixed any malfunctions, and once they were working perfectly in his mind, he just went on build them in reality, and they were working perfectly in reality as well. The next interesting characteristic of thinking is uh, seeing the essence. Seeing the essence is about the relationship between big picture and detail. It is almost common sense to say that those who are the best of us can see the big picture in their discipline. However, from my experience with the Nobel laureates, I can also say that they do see the details as well. They are incredibly fast switching between the two, and they can see how you can tweak that particular detail so that the big picture would change as you want it to, or if you find the new particular detail, they can figure out how that changes the big picture. For example, Joe Taylor, when he discovered the first binary pulsar, he almost immediately understood that he has in hands the first ever empirical proof of Einstein's general theory of relativity. That changed our big picture of physics forever. Until then, Einstein's theory was a strange idea. From that point onwards, it is validated knowledge. Finally, when we think about harmony and beauty, we primarily think of arts. However, harmony and beauty drive human thinking not only in arts, but also in the hard sciences. One particularly great example is the uh, equations of James Clark Maxwell. When he originally created his equations, they accounted for everything that was known in theory or in experiments. And then he looked at these equations and he said, no, they are just not beautiful enough. So he added another component that he called the displacement current. And at the time, it did not make any difference to the calculations because the uh, numeric difference was so small. However, as our measurements became more precise, as our calculations got more refined, we found out that actually the displacement current is necessary to accurately describe electromagnetism. Fantastic difference. Now, let me try to do the same in the realm of learning and artificial intelligence. In September, uh, at the New Scientist Live event, Demis Hassabis talked about, he is the founder and CEO of uh, DeepMind, and he explained the learning algorithms of DeepMind and AlphaGo. AlphaGo is the software that has beaten basically all the best Go players in the world. <coughs> Demis Hassabi says that deep mind learns the same way as human do. It learns through reinforcement learning. What that means? It is rooted in the stimulus response model, means that you have some sort of stimulus, you get a response, if you are happy with the response, you reward, if you are unhappy with the response, you punish, and that way you will sooner or later always get the uh, favorable response. There was a time in psychology uh, when they tried to model human learning this way. Today, we don't call it learning, we call it operant conditioning, not learning. When they created AlphaGo, they, they fed in about 100,000 games as learning examples, and then AlphaGo played some 100 billion games against itself. 
And therefore, it obtained a huge base of moves, and it could relate the statistical frequency whether they lead to win or they lead to loss. Now, don't misunderstand me. AlphaGo is a brilliant achievement. A machine that beats all the best Go players in the world, that's absolutely fantastic. However, it is not the brilliance of AlphaGo, it is the brilliance of its makers. The programmers of AlphaGo were creative and intuitive. In spite of what Demis Hassabi says, AlphaGo was not creative and intuitive. It simply looked up the base of the moves, the statistical frequency of leading to win or loss, and made the move without being constrained by the way how we learned to uh, play Go over the last few thousand years. It is probability, not creativity. It is calculation, not intuition. So let me try to explore how some of those smartest people learned who achieved the highest levels of knowledge. Human, in human learning, I want to emphasize only uh, three uh, different characteristics. The first is the notion of talent. The second is uh, inspiration. And the third is the master-apprentice relationship. Talent is about uh, that we are simply better at learning in some areas. We enjoy learning in some areas more than in some other areas. There is actually a much better word for this in English language, a gift. If someone is gifted in a particular discipline, then the everyday knowledge will be structured in a similar way as the knowledge in that particular discipline. As a secondary school teacher told us once, the kids who are talented in mathematics seem to already have all the mathematical structures in their minds, so all the teacher needs to do is to put a label on them. The second characteristic is inspiration. We can be passionate about learning. We can love learning in some areas more than in others. And it seems that this inspiration often comes from an inspirational teacher. Now, inspirational teachers might not be as frequent as you would like to think. It seems that more or less all the Nobel laureates in physics today were inspired by only two people, either Richard Feynman or Enrico Fermi. Now, what happens when the inspira inspired uh, person wants to learn? They end up in a master-apprentice relationship. It is a unique and ancient form of learning, and we still don't know after thousands of years how it really works. What we seem to know is that it is the only way of passing on tacit knowledge. And from my experience with the Nobel laureates, everyone who achieved the highest level of knowledge went through some sort of master-apprentice relationship. Now, the trick about the master-apprentice relationship is that obviously the apprentice should follow the master's way because by definition the master knows. However, if the apprentice follows the master's way, then the apprentice will become a pale copy of the master rather than an improved version of her or himself. That suggests that it would be bad to follow the master's way. So, if we don't follow the master's way, what happens then? Well, then they will not learn. So this is a clear contradiction, and it is a source of struggle for the apprentice. However, this struggle is exactly the essence of the master-apprentice relationship, because from this struggle, the apprentice will emerge as a new master, as a vastly improved version of her or himself, rather than the pale copy of the master. These are things that machines don't engage in. So, my point is that there is a little bit of data processing in our thinking, and machines are much better at that. Big data processing can process much more data and faster. We are not very good at it. But this means that big data should complement rather than substitute human thinking. Similarly, with artificial intelligence, AI can replicate the statistical frequency of the learning examples 
in contrast, we humans are not that good at learning by reinforcement. This suggests that AI should complement rather than substitute human learning. Therefore, I suggest that we should change the central question of machines versus humans. It is not about whether a smart technology can outperform mediocre human beings. It is also not about whether the top human experts can beat the artificial intelligence. For me, the question is how to get the best of both worlds. And my answer is by smart people using smart technology. Thank you very much.